Hello and welcome everybody to another edition of the Saturdays are for the Byzantines podcast. My name is Professor Wren. I'm your host. It's been a while since we've been on here, so I appreciate everybody's patience. Uh, last weekend I was at a wedding uh, down in Texas for my cousin, uh, which was a lot of fun. But now we are back, we are here, and we are getting ready to go. So just a reminder, if you found this video on YouTube, please make sure to give it a like, subscribe to the channel if you're new, and hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. And then if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Play, please make sure to give us a follow there as well, especially if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please give us a five-star review. It really helps out the show. And so in the last couple episodes, we've had this kind of three-part mini-series of contraction, uh, reconstruction, and uh, this this one uh, uh, previously I'd been calling it expansion, but I really think uh, really this is this is really a uh, what we're going to be talking about, and this is going to be a two-parter here. We're gonna we're gonna split up the the golden age, as I'm going to call it here, the go- a golden age of Byzantine history. We're going to split it up into two lectures because, as you'll see here, we're going to have one of the one of the emperors who we're going to talk about, who's Basil II, sometimes called the Bulgar Slayer. Uh, he reigns for nearly 50 years, so he really, uh, uh, he's going to get a lecture, uh, to himself, which we'll do, which we'll do next week here. But so just to recap, uh, in the last couple lectures, we've talked about things like iconoclasm. We have, uh, I believe the last emperor we left off on was Theophilus. Uh, the Byzantines had made several attempts on the island of Crete, which had failed. There were also Byzantines had been losing ground in Italy, uh, but maintaining their presence in places like Anatolia, maintaining their presence in Greece, uh, uh, continued struggles with groups like the Bulgars, or now we, we can call them Bulgarians, actually, uh, to their uh, north and and west, essentially. And so here we're picking up with, uh, after the passing of the Emperor Theophilus, he is succeeded by his son named Michael, who was only two years old at the time. So Theophilus's widow, Theodora, served as his regent. Uh, this Theodora, not unlike the Theodora of Justinian, a competent, uh, uh, Effective woman, uh, politically effective. Uh, she was an ardent iconophile, meaning again, uh, going back just to just to review here. Or if this is the first episode where you're joining us, please uh, make sure to check out our last two episodes where we go a little more into detail on iconoclasm. Uh, we'll be doing, I will be doing, hopefully coming up here soon. Uh, I'll I'll do a lecture on Saint John Damascus and his response to iconoclasm. He was opposed to iconoclasm, but iconoclasm, right, icon, a religious icon, like a painting of Jesus, Mary the Saints, etc. Um, and then clasm means smashing. So iconoclasm literally means icon smashing. So iconophiles are the opposite of that. File, right, file uh, means love for. And so an iconophile is somebody who loves icons. So Theodora here, the mother of Michael, who's going to be Michael uh, III, was an iconophile. And she worked to get other iconophiles promoted to be bishops because by, by this point in time, the last several emperors had been iconoclasts. And so because in the Byzantine Empire, uh, the emperor has a good deal of say over who gets pr- promoted to be a bishop, uh, those iconoclast emperors were finding kind of, uh, somewhat obscure uh, members of the clergy to promote to become bishops. For the most part, uh, the religious, especially the monks, uh, were iconophiles. But we're in the situation here where Iconoclasts are in church leadership, and so Theodora worked to uh, to reverse that. Uh, during her reign, we also see a breaking up of the Arab Caliphate into smaller emirates, which pop up along the empire's border. Now, this is a, this is a big occurrence because it's going to first of all stave the uh, threat uh, to the Byzantines from the Arab uh, Caliphate. It's not going to be as serious as that. It's still a serious threat. It's still something that needs to, needs to have a lot of attention devoted to it. Uh, but the Arabs are spending a lot of time fighting each other instead of fighting the Byzantines, which is going to relieve a lot of pressure on the eastern front here. And eventually, uh, Theodora is going to... Uh, sorry, she presented Michael with uh, a number of noble women to choose as a wife, sort of a, a bridal show, you know, pick... 
uh, bachelorette number one, bachelorette number two, right? Uh, but Michael already had a mistress who he was pretty content with, and he actually resented his mother a good deal for for trying to uh, make him uh, pick one of these, uh, perhaps uh, you could say women of a uh, better reputation uh, than the woman he was already with. And uh, this resentment, uh, probably among other things, uh, Michael uh, made his mother step down. Uh, I think they're ruling kind of jointly for a little while there, but she uh, she's forced to step down in 856. Now, an important event that comes up here during the reign of uh, Michael III is we begin to see the uh, uh, Christian evangelization work from Saints Cyril and Methodius, who, upon the request of the Prince of Moravia, went to evangelize the Slavic people of Moravia and various other uh, South Slavic groups. Saint Cyril created what we know today as the Cyrillic alphabet uh, for the Slavonic language, which was used in the liturgy, uh, uh, basically Eastern Rite liturgies using the Slavonic language, uh, which was a f fairly mutually intelligible language for that, that most Slavs would have been able to understand. From my understanding, it wouldn't be, uh, Slavonic was not a language you would you people would use to talk to each other at a marketplace or, or if you were like visiting uh, relatives, this was, this Slavonic was not used. But uh, uh, many Slavic languages are more mutually intelligible than uh, like Romance languages. For so, like for example, uh, uh, a person who's speaking Polish and a person who's speaking Slovak um, can understand each other a good deal. That's what mutually intelligible means. That they both, uh, even though they're speaking different languages, there's enough common words there that the, the two people can understand each other. And then the Cyrillic alphabet is used to translate the Bible. Uh, into the uh, into this Slavonic language, so that the Slavs had, because the Slavs didn't have a written language before this, they obviously had uh, spoken languages which were uh, Slavic, but they had not, they hadn't written down languages at this point in time, and so because of that, uh, Saint Cyril has to come up with an alphabet so that they can they can have the sacred scriptures. Uh, it, it is worth noting, though, that not all Slavic groups were claimed. Uh, and evangelized by Saints Cyril and Methodius. Not all Slavs are uh, Eastern Orthodox or Eastern uh, Catholics. So uh, the best example for this, uh, uh, for an exception, would be Poland. So Poland uh, accepted the Western uh, Roman Catholic Church, and so their language uses the Latin alphabet. They don't use the Cyrillic alphabet. Uh, and and they are, uh, they're, they're Western Catholics as well. And Latin was actually the language of no, of the nobility in Poland for quite some time. So nobles would have uh, communicated for like written correspondence, for example, between nobles would have been written in written in Latin instead of in Polish. It's not until I think sometime during the 1700s when uh, Polish becomes uh, uh, more of the co the common polity, uh, the common language uh, among the nobility as well as among the peasantry. Anyway, uh, Michael III, as, as an emperor, although he, you know, we have this good occurrence here of, of uh, evangelization, evangelization work, which he basically just signed off on, uh, Michael III was an, an incompetent and ineffective emperor, and he was eventually assassinated by one of his officials named Basil. Basil I called a church council to reconcile Constantinople with Rome over a fairly minor dispute that's not really worth getting into here. Uh, and, and the two church, you know, the uh, Constantinople was re, uh, you know, reconciled uh, with Rome and the Pope. Basil I also sent missionaries to Serbia. Well, or well, the, the the Serbian people, the Serbs. I can't really. I don't. I don't believe a Serbian kingdom had been established by this point in time. Although it will be later on. Uh, he also built up uh, the military, which found a good success under his reign. Basil then uh, followed was followed by his stepson, who was in all likelihood uh, Leo the Sixth. The thing with Basil was when he came in, uh, there were uh, Michael uh, the Third had a couple of sons with uh, with a woman, uh, but then Basil married uh, the widow of Michael, and it wasn't necessarily clear if uh, the children belonged to Basil or if they or if they were the sons of Basil or the sons of Michael. 
Um, but in all likelihood, Leo VI was the son of Michael, uh, and Basil was his stepfather. I have printed notes in front of me today. This is, I, I really like this. I, I much prefer the printed notes. Now, in 888, Leo VI issues what's called the Basilica, which was a Greek translation of Justinian's Corpus Juris Civilis, uh, which was Justinian's legal codex of uh, a, a compilation of all uh, the Roman law, Roman laws and uh, Roman jurispru jurisprudence, uh, uh, legal opinions and writings, which Justinian put together during his reign, uh, which would have been in Latin because at the time you know, Justinian was a native uh, Latin speaker and the administrative of the uh, empire at that point in time was still Latin. However, by this point in time, the administrative language has transitioned over to Greek. Latin is basically uh, not really, really not used at all in, in the Byzantine Empire. And so a Greek translation would be useful. And also it's been about, you know, over 300 years since the reign of Justinian. So there's going to be new laws and other things like that. So uh, the, the Basilica has the additions to it, uh, uh, things that have been added to the legal code, legal yeah, legal codex since uh, since the reign of Justinian. In 900, Leo sent an army to the emirate of Tarsus. So this is one of these uh, emirates that is popping up along the border with the Byzantine. And th th this is another thing that's uh, very important about the the, the cracking of, of the caliphate and the breaking up uh, uh, with with some emir small emirates splitting off. A lot of them are on the Byzantine border uh, on their eastern front. So Tarsus, if you uh, if you know your uh, Middle Eastern geography, uh, and if you know your biblical history, right? Saint Paul was born in Tarsus, so it's an important city, uh, and it's in uh, eastern, south eastern, uh, what would today be Turkey. Uh, there's also a, a city there today, uh, Adana, uh, if you're familiar with that, uh, and so it's sort of in that uh, uh, in the Medi Mediterranean. Eastern Mediterranean, where Turkey meets uh, Syria, and there's kind of that little armpit there. Tarsus is right on the on the Turkey, the Turkish uh, northern side of that. And the army that Leo sends captures the Emir of Tarsus, making uh, progress here on the Eastern Front. And this, right, the breaking up these small emirates are much easier for the Byzantines to fight with uh, when victory is over and gain control over than the than the giant blob of the of the Caliphate, the previously uh, uh, fully united uh, Arab groups here. And we're going to see here that the Byzantines are able to make uh, some some pretty good progress here against these these smaller emirates along their eastern front as the years go on, as as we'll talk about here. Now the Arabs responded to this attack on Tarsus a couple of years later, three years later to be precise, uh, by sending a navy to sack uh, Thessalonica. They kind of got in through the back door there. However, uh, Treadgold says that th this was more of a lapse of uh, security than any kind of. Uh, uh, indication that the tides were turning in, in the constant struggle here. And then in 911, uh, Leo sent a fleet to Crete in an attempt to retake it, but this failed, and then he died a year later. We see, we're see we going to see this uh, a couple times here, and I, th I think we already have, uh, the Byzantines trying to retake Crete, because uh, Crete, obviously, they're right by, uh, uh, right by the Aegean Sea, and uh, you know, it, it basically becomes a base uh, for for piracy and and for raiding throughout the Aegean, uh, up to you know uh, uh, Thessalonica and up to uh, uh, Constantinople, and so to, the Byzantines are going to be trying to uh, regain control of Crete here, uh, and they're going to there's going to be more attempts here coming up. So then uh, uh, later on, there's a couple there's a couple disputes over the over uh, the imperial crown. A couple guys are fighting over it. And uh, in 920, we get the Emperor Romanus. Now, Romanus, a little less than a decade later, uh, so a decade, uh, around somewhere around 927, 928, uh, there is a very harsh winter that comes up, and uh, many of the crops fail in the in the empire, and a lot of the small farmers within the empire are uh, in a state of desperation, sell off their farms to local uh, wealthy landowners, big landowners, magnates, etc., and they become renters on the land. 
Now, this action could have potentially led to the wealthy landowners basically uh, using this as a sort of a tax loophole and paying uh, little to no taxes on these new holdings with, where the, the state could previously collect revenues from the small farmers. And so Romanus put in place a law that said that peasants could only sell their land to other peasants. They couldn't sell their land to members of the nobility or the senators or guys like that. And that the uh, the nobles who had bought this land had to sell it back to the peasants who they bought it from. Now, this law was not often enforced. However, uh, we'll see coming up here in the future. Actually, we'll really we'll talk about it in the next in next week's lecture. Um, ba- Basil II is going to uh, uh, try to force this a little harder. Um, but, but it is an issue, right? You've got all these peasants now who are who are renting. They no longer own their land. They're not paying the, the same taxes on it as they previously did. And Treadgold, it was, I couldn't exactly understand why it was that the, 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 the wealthy landowners, when they came into acquisition of this land, didn't have to pay taxes on it. Um, but point being was that uh, oftentimes they could get away with not paying taxes or were just not required to pay taxes. Yeah. And so, obviously, with, with many of these farmers uh, uh, selling off their, their land, this is a, a serious loss in revenue for the state. And the state, obviously, needs their revenue for, number one, paying the military, right? You've got the Byzantines have enemies on every single border. They're, they're, putting, they're being pressured from all directions, and so the military absolutely needs to continue to be funded. Um, and so this is a problem. then in 934, uh, you get the general John uh, Kirkwas, Kirkwas. Uh, and uh, he conquers the whole emirate of Melitin, uh, which is uh, north of Edessa. So the Byzantines are now, they have a good stronghold, or they have a good foothold in the emirate of Tarsus, and as well as the emirate of Melitin. Uh, uh, so you can imagine there, they're kind of expanding uh, eastward from their holdings in Anatolia, picking up Tar- the Tarsus and the surrounding area, and some of the land north of Edessa. And now we're going to learn, we're going to talk a little bit about, we're going to talk a lot about a guy named Nikephorus Phocas, uh, who is a Cappadocian Greek. He, uh, he's born out there in Cappadocia, which is in uh, eastern and in east central Anatolia, and he's from a military family. The, the Byzantines are going to get a lot of Good soldiers, good military recruits from Cappadocia. It's fairly rural. It's kind of a rough terrain. Uh, those those of you who uh, study military history, know anything about military history, know that oftentimes these rugged uh, rural areas produce the best uh, soldiers. You look at like the American Civil War, for example. Uh, the South, at the beginning, the Confederacy, at the beginning of the American Civil War, had the advantage of having better soldiers, and that was in large part due uh, to the fact that uh, the South was more rural, it was more rugged, and that produces uh, you know, people who are more used to being out in the woods, people are, who are used to surviving off the land. Uh, hunting you know, is, is a big thing in these areas, and so uh, those are skills that are useful in warfare. Uh, the North, on the other hand, more urbanized, the, that kind of life does not uh, force people to develop skills which are also useful in warfare. And Nikephorus Phocas, Nikephorus Phocas is born in 912, and he's actually venerated as a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Now, Romanus was, uh, going, going back to our little story here, you'll see where Phocas comes in here in a minute. We'll, we'll bring him into Phocas. Ha ha ha, see what I did there? Uh, but so Romanus was followed briefly by his son Constantine VII, uh, and he has a very short reign, and he and then Constantine the seventh is followed by Romanus the second. Now, Romanus the second's reign was fairly short and, for the most part, insignificant. However, he does there. There is one significant thing that he does here, which is definitely it's worth noting. Obviously, it's significant, uh, and it's that he promoted one of the main characters who we're going to follow here for a while here, Nikephorus Phocas. Uh, he promotes him to be the domestic of the East, which is sort of like a commander-in-chief of the Eastern Front of the uh, Byzantine Empire and in charge of the military there. One of uh, Nikephorus Phocas's first tasks, as in this, in this uh, new, very prestigious uh, uh, military commander, 
position uh, is that he had to retake Crete, which we talked about before. Uh, several Byzantine forces had been sent to Crete. Many of them failed to retake the island. Uh, the, the Arabs had strong naval forces around there, and oftentimes, even if the Byzantines could land there, uh, it was very well defended. But Nikephor's focus was an, ex an incredibly competent commander. He, he's one of the best generals that the Byzantines are going to have here. And he does manage to take Crete, even though many in the past had failed. And uh, he, so Nikephor's focus conquers Greek and turns it into a theme. A uh, theme being, uh, if you go back a couple of episodes, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly which episode this was in, but we talked about how the Byzantines had this uh, uh, regional administrative reform uh, called the thematic reform, where a theme was an administrative unit in the Byzantine Empire, which was governed by, uh, I believe the word was a strategos, who had both military and uh, civil authority in his particular theme, and there were armies that were assigned to those areas to defend them, where the soldiers uh, lived off the land, made it more uh, important for them to defend land because they're the people who have to live on it, and if you know, if they lose, then their towns are destroyed, their families are harmed, and all of that. Now, after his success in Crete, Nikephorus was assigned to put down some opposition in the Emirate of Tarsus, right? We mentioned earlier that the Byzantines had gotten a foothold in Tarsus, but just because, you know, oftentimes, very, we're, we're going to see very often here, uh, just because the Byzantines go into a particular territory and win a battle and maybe uh, subjugate a people doesn't, that, doesn't mean that's going to last for very long. Uh, the only time you're going to see a permanence in this is if they create, like, a, a ducat, or I might call it a duchy, kind of a Western bias here, or they establish a theme or something like that where they incorporate a territory into the into their empire. Things with like client states and subjugating and protectorates and all that, a lot of times those those are short-lived. And the Byzantines are going to have to go right back in at, you know, a couple of years later because the, there's trouble stirring. Uh, but so Nikephorus, he is assigned to uh, put down the opposition that's in the Emirate of Tarsus, and he does that, and then after that he invades Syria and sacks the city of Aleppo. Uh, when they completed this conquest, uh, Nikephorus learned of the untimely passing of Romanus II. Like I said, he had a short, somewhat insignificant reign, although promoting Nikephorus' focus is uh, a pretty good, uh, pretty good promotion there. So we got we got to give Romanus uh, credit for that. Now, Romanus left two young sons who were and a widow uh, who were too young to reign. One of them is uh, going to be Basil II here, and as well as his brother. And, uh, but those two guys, they're, they're too young, so Nikephorus is, uh, makes a deal to marry Theophano, who was, uh, Theophano was the widow of Romanus, and so that makes uh, Nikephorus focus the emperor, and he basically, uh, he was 51 at the time, and so in all likelihood by the time, uh, you know, Basil would have come of age, uh, he probably, he would either be dead or so old that, you know, they would rule jointly for a time, and this seemed to be an agreeable uh, uh, deal for everybody involved. And so Nikephorus' focus begins his reign as Byzantine emperor in 963, like I said, at the age of 51. In 964, he sends fleets out to Sicily and Cyprus uh, to retake the uh, both islands. Uh, the Sicilian expedition failed, However, the Cypriot, the one to Cyprus, uh, that expedition succeeded. So the Byzantines, so Nikephorus personally takes Crete, and then he also, under his reign, the Byzantines take Cyprus, but fail to uh, assert for full control over Sicily. Uh, he also fully conquered the Emirate of Tarsus and created uh, the theme of Cilicia, or Cilicia, if you're of the Greek persuasion. Uh, but so the Emirate of Tarsus is no more, and now we have the theme of Cilicia, Cilicia is just the, the region around, like, Tarsus would be the, the capital of the region, and Cilicia is the name of the region. Uh, then, under his rule as well, the Byzantines also annexed much of Armenia and besieged Antioch. Uh, however, uh, Armenia, it's, it's a very... Uh, uh, it's a very back-and-forth situation where uh, sometimes the Byzantines have full control over it, a partial control over it. There's a number of different uh, uh, emirates and you know, kingdoms and things like that. Uh, you have the Iberians and the Georgians up there as well. It's it's a very messy situation. Just, you know, like I said, uh, they gain tr control over it, and then a couple of years later, the trouble starts brewing, and then they don't have control over it. Uh, then in 967... Uh, Nikephorus persuades, persuade, 
per suades, excuse me, I have to try to slow down. I'm a very fast talker, I do understand that, uh, so I, if any of you need to listen to this in like uh, half speed, I, yeah, I understand. I, I, maybe I should try to make myself slow down a little more when I talk here. But anyway, so Nikephorus persuades the Russian uh, prince Sevastislav uh, to help in fighting the Bulgars. Now I say, I'm being intentional here when I say Russian instead of Russian, because Russia at this point in time is really not a state. Uh, you have more Kievian Rus, uh, or you could say Kievan Rus. Um, uh, but so Sevastislav was the prince of uh, basically Kievan Rus, and uh, Nikephorus persuades him to come down uh, south to fight the Bulgars so he can, uh, the, he gets the Bulgars in a, prince, in a pincer maneuver, right? The, uh, the Russians are coming down from the north, the Byzantines can attack them from the south, and uh, they get them from both angles. However, this uh, uh, this plan works for a time, but eventually the Russians are going to be uh, a problem for the Byzantines, and they're going to have a, a, a kind of a brief conflict there. Around the same time, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor Otto I began raiding Byzantine Italy because Nikephorus refused to send him a Byzantine princess to marry. Now, Nikephorus wanted to get his focus, huh, get it, uh, on the Eastern Front. He didn't want, he wanted to uh, keep everything focused on the Eastern Front, didn't want to have, by this point in time, uh, the Western Front was not necessarily his, uh, his pr uh, main focus. Uh, and so he conquers Edessa, which has, still has a significant Christian population. So one, Edessa is one of the more prominent cities there in Syria, along with Aleppo, Antioch, and Damascus, I would say. And then he also pushed uh, toward, he, and he pushes towards Antioch. Uh, there he experienced some, at the siege of Antioch, he, he experiences some supply issues, and so he leaves a small army to maintain the siege during the winter because you know, there, you're, there's not going to be a lot of risk of... Uh, that army being attacked because, you know, during the winter, the armies just aren't moving around. But then he comes back in the spring uh, with better supplies, and the Byzantines actually storm the city, uh, or storm the walls, I should say, and take the city. So now the city, now Antioch is back in the Byzantine Empire. After many centuries of Antioch being in Arab hands, Antioch is now in the hands of the Byzantines, and it will remain there for a while here. Now, despite Nikephorus' many achievements here, and I mean, we're looking really good, you know, he takes over Crete, he takes over Cyprus, he takes over Edessa, he sacks Aleppo, he establishes the, uh, uh, the theme of Cilicia, he brings Antioch back into the empire. Uh, he had become unpopular back at the imperial court because he didn't spend a lot of time in Constantinople, right? He's a military guy, he's out. Uh, he's fight. He's doing all this fighting in person. He's not just ordering generals around and, and sending letters out of the capital, which is obviously very admirable. And and you know many of us hear that and we think, oh well, that's a great thing. He's he's leading his men from the front, but uh, he neglected many important people back in Constantinople, uh, very notably his wife and his domestic of the west and no, the east, the east. Uh, John Smitskys, who had been a, a subordinate general of his before uh, before he was emperor, John Smitskys was. And Smitskys and uh, Nikephorus' wife put together a plot, uh, an unusually quiet plot, very, very effective, uh, to have Nikephorus killed. And then they marry each other, which they did, making uh, John Smitskys the emperor in 969. Now, John Smitskys, or Emperor John I, was Armenian on his father's side and Cape, uh, Cappadocian Greek on his mother's side. So he's you know, kind of part Armenian, part Greek. Uh, his mother was from the Focus family, so it does seem that uh, you know, uh, he and Nikephorus Focus would have been related somehow. They, they weren't like brothers. Uh, I don't even think they were cousins, or at least not first cousins, I, I don't think. Uh, but they would have probably had some sort of relation here uh, from, from Semitsky's mother. And his last name is Semitsky's. It's kind, it's kind of uh, unusual. Um, it appears to be the name of the town from which uh, he was from, according to uh, historian Matthew uh, Vedessa, the, the medieval historian there. Um, 
and he was from a respected military family, and he was born in 925. Now, the, the, uh, the way that John gets to the throne, right, he is a usurper, and as we've talked about before on the, so, the show, uh, usurpers have issues with legitimacy. They don't have a, legitim- a legitimate claim to the throne, especially after Nikephorus Phocas had done so well, had, had so many accomplishments, and there was really no reason to, to assassinate him. Like, he wasn't unpopular, he wasn't, he, he wasn't uh, involved in any kind of scandal, uh, he, you know, he was doing lots of good for the empire, um, it was really out of just pure ambition that he was killed. And so this is going to create an, amp- an issue for John Smitsky's. So what he has to do is, in order to be coronated emperor by the patriarch of Constantinople, uh, he had to cut a deal. And <laughs> this is uh, very humorous. One of the conditions in the deal that he made with the patriarch of Constantinople was that he had to exile his new wife, so he conspires with this, uh, with the wife of the previous emperor, to uh, to kill uh, her husband basically, and then they would marry each other, and he would become emperor. Um, but John does as the patriarch requests because he needs to be coronated. He needs some sense of legitimacy, and so he has uh, his new wife exiled to a convent. I, I might have been in Crimea, although I, don't quote me on that. I'm not entirely sure. But I guess the lesson here is, you know. Don't uh, get involved with people who are willing to kill other people for political advancement because they will throw you under the bus just as easily as they threw. And, and you know, Smitsky's and uh, Nikephoros Focus were, they were buddies. Um, or maybe not so, you know, they, they had worked together. They had known each other quite well. Um, so be careful with the company you keep, man. They throw, they throw one person under the bus, they'll throw you under the bus too. And then keep in mind, at this point in time, the two sons of Romanus II are still too young uh, to reign. The Kefir's focus in uh, John Smitsky's basically serve as their, as their regents. Now, in order to fully devote his attention to the Eastern Front, John Smitsky's uh, needed to pus- push the Russians out of Bulgaria. They, uh, the Russians, in, uh, by this point in time, instead of just being a Byzantine ally here and fighting the Bulgarians, they're also pushing into Byzantine territory as well. And so in order to focus his attention on the East, John needs to clear this up in, in the West, in the, in, the, in the European front. Now, John quickly and easily defeated the Russians twice and pushed them out of Bulgaria for good, and they went back up to, to their, you know, to the uh, little kingdom there uh, in Kievan Rus'. So once John got to the east, he fully subjugated the emirate of Aleppo. Remember, we said earlier that Nikephorus Focus only sacked it. He didn't. Uh, he didn't make it a client state of the Byzantine Empire. But John Smitsky does do that. He does make the emirate of Aleppo a Byzantine client state. And then his next target was the emirate of Mosul. Now John initially sent an army to the emirate of Mosul, not led by himself, uh, which was defeated, and their general was captured. However, the following year, uh, John went to Mosul himself and subjugated the emirate and exacted annual tribute from them. So we're, we're, you know, we're talking about making some pretty serious advancements into Arab territory here. Uh, Mosul is, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's down in Iraq. That's, that's fairly far away from where, uh, what the Byzantine border was when we started talking about this, certainly when we were in our uh, contraction episode. And so the Byzantines are doing pretty well here. They're, they're, uh, pushing back against the Arabs, they're really, at this point in time, they're more powerful than the Arabs, especially these smaller uh, uh, little emirates that are uh, around their border. They're, they're really, uh, uh, they have the upper hand here. Now, I wouldn't, you wouldn't go so far to say as uh, they're more powerful, uh, I, I, at least I wouldn't say that they're more powerful than the caliph and the caliphate based out of Baghdad, but they're still doing pretty good. Now, continuing his campaign on the Eastern Front, uh, John Smitsky's moved south uh, into southwestern Syria, taking much of the Syrian coast. He takes you know, cities like uh, Beirut, for example. The only one that holds out for a while is Tripoli, uh, but he completes the conquest of the Syrian uh, coastline there. So the Byzantines controlled the entire coast of Syria. The interior of Syria still partly in control of the Arabs there, like Dam- Damascus, for example. They don't, they don't hold uh, Damascus. 
And John uh, wanted to push even further south into Palestine. Uh, he wanted to uh, take Jerusalem. He had uh, written to people and talked to, about uh, attacking uh, the Fatimids. Now, the Fatimid uh, Caliphate was based out of Egypt. This was a Shia Caliphate. Uh, the most of the other uh, Caliphates we're talking about here are Sunni Muslims. The Fatimids are Shia, uh, claiming uh, descendants from uh, Fatima, who was a who was a I believe a daughter of Muhammad. Uh, I don't quote me on that. Yeah, double check, Google it. Uh, but, uh, so John Smiskies does want to push against the Fatimids down into Palestine and take Jerusalem. However, and they were weak at the time, I should say, but however, John died suddenly of an illness or possibly poisoning there in 967. And so there, uh, that there's where we're going to leave it off today. The Byzantines are in good shape here. They, they've pushed against the Arabs real hard. They've made a number of advancements. They've taken back a, a significant amount of territory. Uh, militarily, they're very powerful. And so next week, what we are going to be talking about is uh, the Emperor Basil II. Again, like I said, he reigns for nearly 50 years, so we can, we can devote uh, an episode uh, to him basically entirely. Basil II is going to be different from Nikephor's focus and John Smitsky's because his focus is his uh, uh, military focus is going to be uh, in Europe. He's going to fight. Most of his uh, campaigns are against the Bulgarians. He uh, he's going to make a couple of truces with the Fatimids to uh, secure his his eastern front so that he can focus more so on Europe. And and by this point in time, uh, Basil II is about eighteen years old, so he's more than uh, old enough to to ascend to the throne. But if you made it this far in the video, please make sure to give us a like, subscribe to the channel if you are new, and hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. We are also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play, so if you're listening to us on any of those platforms or another podcast platform, if it's, I don't know exactly how Podbean sends all of these things out, but whatever, whatever you're listening on, please make sure to give us a follow, and especially if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a five-star review that really helps grow the show. And so that's all I have for you guys this time, and I'll see y'all next time.